Well, let's go ahead. We're in the book of Judges. It's turning out to be a very, very relevant book in more ways than I would have anticipated. But we are finishing chapter 11 and taking it from there. Now, you may recall we are facing, if you will, the main adversaries from the east, namely the Ammonites. We have this interesting character, Jephthah, who was ostracized by his family and his community because he was the illegitimate son of a, or I should say illegitimate son, he was, he was a son of a, a concubine. So his, his brothers didn't accept him. So he, he took off to the northeast, literally on the frontier, a place called uh, Tob, which he uh, organized a, a group of brigands. He's sort of a Robin Hood, if you will, of the area. But uh, as you may recall, the people of Gilead had an army to fight the, these people that had been oppressing, oppressing them, the Ammonites, but no leader. And so they uh, cajole him to be the leader. If he'll, if he'll lead the army to victory, they'll make him the ruler. And uh, he takes it on. Now, one thing to be careful of as we talk about Jephthah, he's kind of a rough character. Uh, he apparently knows how to organize a group of people and how to win uh, engagements. But a man of the hills and what have you. But don't presume from that lifestyle a lack of spirituality. If you look at him carefully, you'll discover all the way through the Lord's first. And the authentication of that, if you will, is that he is featured in the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, sometimes called the Hall of Faith, which is a chronicle of the great men of faith of the Scripture. Uh, many of them listed and others sort of aggregated in groups. But he is named there as a, a, a honored, if you will, recognize that despite his shortcomings, what they may be, he is called of God and empowered by the Spirit and so forth. And uh, we carried that all the way up to, up to verse 30 last time. And I deliberately took, took a break because I wanted to address specifically one of the main things for which he's noted is which was a huge mistake. Now you may recall, he's around the mitzvah area there. As he takes over the army to go up against the Ammonites, he first of all attempts diplomacy. It was a good strategy. It's also required by the Torah, if you will. And he gave them a four-part argument. He, he talked about the facts of history, that their claim to the land is unfounded. They have a land grant from the Lord, is his second argument. Furthermore, they lived there for 300 years, far longer than the other guys were. And, they were. and furthermore, fighting them was fighting God. That was the four key points he makes in his attempt to negotiate with the Ammonites. And what's so provocative to me about that, his whole strategy, that is the same four arguments that apply today. And the facts of history are ignored by the media. Israel's on the land grant of the Lord that uh, goes back 3,000 years. There's been 3,000, 10 times the duration of occupation as indicated here in Judges. And uh, we need to understand that we muck around the Middle East, uh, you're poking our finger in the eye of God. So I think the parallels there are really quite startling. There have been many through the book of Judges, there'll be some more, but I wanted to highlight that to you. But in any case, we got up to about verse 30, and there occurs an incredibly controversial episode that we want to examine a bit. And uh, in the exuberance of going into battle, Jephthah makes a vow. Lord, if you'll give me victory, and, and we'll examine his thing. In Judges chapter 11, verse 30 and 31, we'll pick it up. Jephthah vowed a vow unto the Lord and said, If thou shalt without fail deliver the children of Ammon into mine hands, then it shall be that whatsoever cometh forth of the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the children of Ammon shall surely be the Lord's, and I will offer it up for a burnt offering. A rash thing. Now, vows are voluntary. But when one makes a vow to the Lord, the Lord expects you to keep it. That applies to people of you know, Enron and, and uh, WorldCom and so forth. We'll, go, we'll look at that vow in a minute, but let's see what happened and follows afterwards. So Jephthah passed over unto the children of Ammon to fight against them. And the Lord delivered them into his hands. And he smote them from Arar, even till thou cometh to Minnith, even twenty cities, actually villages as we would think of it, and unto the plain of the vineyards with a very great slaughter. And thus the children of Ammon were subdued before the children of Israel. Summarized in a couple of verses here is an incredible victory. 
They had been, you know, oppressed for what, 18 years? And through the leadership of Jephthah, and obviously the commitment of the tribes in Gilead, Gilead being the term there for the area we think of Israel that is uh, east and slight to the north of the Sea of Galilee, close to what we consider the Galan Heights, but except it's a larger area than that. And Jephthah came to Mizpah, that's his hometown, unto his house, and guess what happened? Behold, his daughter came out to meet him with timbrels and with dances, and she was his only child. Beside her he had neither son nor daughter. Can you imagine his heartbreak? He made this rash vow. It's doubtful that that's what he anticipated would happen. We'll get into the speculations of what he might have had on his mind. But in any case, what a heartbreak to realize he's trapped. He made this rash vow and out comes his only child, a daughter. It came to pass when he saw her that he rent his clothes. That's a very Jewish thing to do. When someone dies or there's really bad news, it's very typical even today for an Orthodox Jew to tear his coat, to rent his clothes. He said, Alas, my daughter, thou hast brought me very low, and thou art one of them that trouble me, for I have opened my mouth unto the Lord, and I cannot go back. And she said unto him, My father, if thou hast opened thy mouth unto the Lord, do to me according to that which hath proceeded out of thy mouth. For as much as the Lord hath taken vengeance for thee of thine enemies, even the children of Ammon. And she said unto her father, Let this thing be done for me. In other words, she has one request. Let me alone for two months, that I may go up and down upon the mountains and bewail my virginity, I and my fellows, or friends. He said, Go. And he sent her away for two months. She went with her companions and bewailed her virginity upon the mountains. And it came to pass at the end of two months that she returned to her father, who did with her according to his vow, which he had vowed. And she knew no man, and it was a custom in Israel, that the daughters of Israel went yearly to lament the daughter of Jephthah, the Gileadite, four days in a year. So this is celebrated for, in the region at least, maybe not nationally, but in the region, for four days a year, the uh, plight, the tragic end, if you will, of Jephthah's daughter. Now this passage is a very, very troubling passage. And the more you study it, the more complicated and more troubling it becomes. And I can tell you that the majority of commentators, many, many competent, some of the most venerated of our expositors, virtually insist that he sacrificed as a burnt offering his daughter. That's a very commonly held, that's not an extreme view, that's the common view of conservative uh, expositors. And, uh, but there are some issues here. I want you to understand before we go any further, that there are, a number, there are two major views about this. And the view I'm going to share with you is a minority. It's not incompetent. There's some competent authorities that side on the side I'm going to show you. But the majority of the competent experts argue that there was a burnt offering involved and the burnt offering was his daughter. But there's some issues here. Voluntary vows, first of all, were acceptable. But the Lord did expect them to be fulfilled. Not in Leviticus, we just came from the study of the book of Leviticus, and it's going to do us well to keep in mind what we learned in that uh, survey of the book. But Leviticus 27, Numbers 30, Deuteronomy 23, all deal with the essential expectation that God expects you to keep your vows. And we can spend some time on that, because that's one of the most critical problems in our society today. Not necessarily vows in the traditional covenant to, before the Lord kind of sense, but the one thing in our culture that I have witnessed myself over the last couple of decades is an astonishing decay in what we would call the sanctity of a commitment. Uh, I spent a 30-year career before my 10 years of full-time study and speaking. Uh, I spent 30 years in the corporate boardrooms of America, and I was spoiled because I dealt with, I had the privilege of dealing with some very top-door guys, I, I realized looking back. And one of the biggest shocks I'd had is going from the 30 years of a secular board, uh, corporate boardroom career to the 10 years, I'll call it, of, of professional Christianity, if I can put it in quotations, is the de degradation of integrity. Because in those 30 years, in 12 different public boardrooms uh, over those years, only once can I recall we having to remove an officer for breach of fiduciary duty for a moral turpitude issue. And uh, in the 10 years I've been professional Christianity, we've done it at least three times. And so my experience has been very, very 
uh, caused me to be very cynical about the Christian community, so-called professional community. But I also realized something else as I stand back a little further. Not only did I shift careers, time went by, because I'm beginning to realize even the corporate world that from which I came clearly has its serious problems, problems that would be unthinkable 10 or 20, 30 years ago. The kind of rampant deceit and stuff that appears to have occurred among the auditors whose whole claim to services is the purity of, of perspective. And to see them tarnished and tinged, and it, it's, it's a shock. But as we look at the business community, which is I'm most familiar with, let's also be candid and not uh, exclude marriages. There's all this discussion about divorce and this and that, and that's fine. I'm no expert in that, but I think we all recognize there's some problems, uh, widespread problems, uh, both sides of that issue. But what every, in most of the discussions that I see about that, what's ignored is the fact that it's a vow before God that eclipses our social mores, that eclipses uh, our other commitments. It's a commitment before the throne of God. That's scary stuff. That's scary stuff. But in any case, Jephthah, whatever he did vow, I'll come back to that issue, he executed. The scripture tells us whatever it was, he did do it. The question is, what did he do? And uh, what did he really vow? And there's some. Dis- I want, we're going to discuss that a little bit. Did he keep his vow? Absolutely. That's confirmed in the text. Did he really sacrifice his only daughter as a burnt offering? The answer by most Bible expositors, competent experts, is that he did. But I'm going to suggest to you that that view has some difficulties that I frankly embrace. First of all, Jephthah was a spirit-filled guy. We know that from the text. We've seen that several places confirmed in this chapter. He knew that Jehovah, or Yahweh, however you want to pronounce his name, didn't approve of or accept human sacrifices. That's in Leviticus 18, Leviticus 20, Deuteronomy 12, 18. It's all, there's a handful of passages which makes it clear that God in no way condones a human sacrifice. The only example that one can point to in the scriptures when God tells Abram to offer a son, and that was a test that was got himself interrupted. Doesn't count. That's not a doctrinal. That has some very specific reasons. We've talked well about that. Something else you should recognize. Jephthah's friends and neighbors would never have permitted him to slay his daughter, his only daughter, in order to fulfill a foolish vow. You may recall Saul, King Saul, had made a foolish vow regarding his son Jonathan. And his soldiers prevented him from completing that vow. There's a scriptural basis for that in 1 Samuel 14, for those of you who uh, want to check that out. We can't help but wonder what on earth was on Jephthah's mind when he made the vow. What did he expect to come out of the door when he got home? A servant, maybe? Possibly. The whatsoever term in the text does imply an expectation of a person rather than a pet or a piece of livestock or whatever. But what was his expect? What happens if whatever came out of that house is not acceptable to the Lord? A visiting stranger or an unclean animal. Suppose a, a, a household pet came out that's unclean, Levitically. He's going to offer that? Doesn't make sense. And what if it was a neighbor visiting or a neighbor's child? I mean, what was Jeff the thing? You know, there, there's some issues here. And what right would Jeff the have to take a life of, say, even a servant that worked for him? Let's, it goes a little further. Let's assume he was thinking in terms of a sacrifice. Where would the sacrifice, this is something most people don't even talk about in the commentaries, where would the sacrifice have to be given? The scripture's clear on that. The Lord only accepted sacrifices where? In the tabernacle altar. And offered only by whom? Levitical priests. If you as a rank and file person want to give an offering, you took your offering, gave it to a priest, and he offered it on the altar at the tabernacle. Where was the tabernacle these days? It wasn't in Jerusalem these days. We were early here. We're judges. It's in Shiloh. Okay. So that's the next point. And by the way, even the most unspiritual priest is unthinkable that he would offer a human sacrifice on the sacred altar of the tabernacle. You show up with an offering. It's a human sacrifice. It's unthinkable that this would possibly have accomplished or would have been the situation. 
By the way, Leviticus 13, you may or may not recall, an offering had to be a male. So what are you talking about? Him offering his daughter? There's no place to do it. They'd never accept it. And she's a female. It's prohibited in, in more ways than one. It gets more complicated. He'd have to go to Shiloh. We'll learn in chapter 12 that there is a blood feud between the people of Gilead and the Ephraimites. And Shiloh is right in the middle of the area called Ephraim. Now, it's unthinkable that he would have gone there without some comment in the text. You'd say he still could have gone there, even though there's this attitude, it would have been recorded. So there's a problem there, as we'll touch on shortly. But there's another issue that's overlooked by everybody. Leviticus 27 provides that there is an amount, a redemption price, that would redeem an offering. The firstborn of every family belonged to the Lord. And so you purchased, you redeemed him with a priest by a certain amount of silver. The, the prices were established. So if he, even if he had really intended and, and articulated the idea he's going to offer his daughter, no problem. You go to Shiloh and find out, you know, find out what the amount is and you pay it. And he would have had, he was, he was a victorious general. He had just wiped out the Ammonites. The booty alone would made him, made him a wealthy man, quite apart from the fact that he's the ruler of the country. He'd have no problem complying to the Levitical requirement by redeeming under Levitical procedures to avoid the literal sacrifice of his daughter. Do you follow me? And it's interesting to me that, that, that other than Warren Wearsby in his commentary, most of the commentaries, I've got quite a library of those, uh, miss any of the, most of these points. I'm indebted to Warren Wearsby for many of these because he was, he was on his toes. And... Uh, now, as we look at his vow more carefully, I want to show you something that most expositors have missed. 11, uh, Judges 11, verse 30, it says, Jephthah vowed a vow unto the Lord and said, If thou shalt without fail deliver the children of Ammon unto mine hands, then it shall be that whatsoever, and the word there in the Hebrew implies at least a person, cometh forth of the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the children of Ammon, shall surely be the Lord's. That can mean lots of different things so far. Then we encounter one letter. It's called a vav, and or I will offer it up for a burnt offering. Now this vav is a, it's the vav connective. It's a letter of, the, it's one of the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet that often is used to just give a, a certain kind of a sound. There generally aren't vowels, but that sometimes behaves sort of like a vowel. But it's also used as a grammatical device as a connective, the vowel connective. And I want to talk a little bit about George Boole. George Boole was an Irish mathematician. In 1854, invented a form of algebra, which today is called Boolean algebra. You and I are probably familiar, at least to some extent, with mathematical algebra, at, with, which typically has four mathematical operations. Addition, subtraction, and addition fast called multiplication, and subtraction fast called division. The four basic mathematical operators. George Boole developed a group of others that are called logical operators. And you'll hear the term Boolean logic which is the cornerstone of most of the circuit analysis of most computers. There is a logic that can be formalized. And it turns out that this VOB that you see on the chart here is normally a conjunction, which is, in other words, if I have A and B, the statement is true if both A and B are true. If this and this, thus this. In other words, it's, it's a requirement that they both have to be true. And that's called a conjunction. We also have a thing called a disjunction, and that's A or B. It's, it's typically can be modeled very similar to a parallel circuit, where an electron can go down either of two paths to get the other end, but only, it only needs one to be good. Either one makes it true. So in a conjunction, they both have to be true for the statement to be true, otherwise it's false. In the disjunction, one or the other have to fit, and it, it complies. You with me? Now, what's interesting, we translate the conjunction grammatically as and. A and B it means I need both of them. Tom and Jerry are coming to the store. Well, that means they both came, right? But I can also use a disjunction called or. Tom or Jerry will come with me to the store. I only need one of them. Follow me? 
That's a disjunction. And the insight is that the vav connective can is usually a conjunction. It can also be a disjunction. Then it shall be that whatsoever cometh forth of the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the children of Ammon shall surely be the Lord's. That could mean that if it's a servant or a person, that person will be dedicated to the Lord. Okay? You may have had in mind one of the people on the staff that comes out, that person will be, his indentured servitude, whatever, will be applied to the priests of the tabernacle. And there were such people that served the house, not formally as a priest, but they, they had other things they needed them to do. Or, if it's not a person, I will up, offer it up as a burnt offering. So it's an animal, not a person. It becomes an offering. Okay, we're together? That's a possibility. With that conjecture, that it's a, it's a, a disjunction, not a conjunction, let's go on and see now, let's go read again from verse 32 on. So Jephthah passed over the children of Ammon to fight against them, and the Lord delivered them into his hands, and he smote them for our uh, By the way, I could... Uh, Give you a little more background here. Um, the R is about 14 miles east of the Dead Sea, if you're familiar with the geography. And uh, it's at the southern boundary of the area of Reuben. It's where the King's Highway, as it's called, on the main north-south uh, trade routes. But anyway, 20 cities uh, under the plain of the vineyards with a very great slaughter. Thus the children of Ammon were subdued. So God did his part of the, the vow. God certainly did. So Jephthah came to Mizpah, which is his hometown, to his house. And behold, his daughter, oh my goodness, came out to meet him with timbrels and the dances, and she was his only child besides her. She had never, he had neither son or daughter. This guy must be crushed. He shook up. It came to pass when he saw her that he rent his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, thou hast brought me very low. Thou art one of them that trouble me, for I have opened my mouth unto the Lord, and I cannot go back. So she's committed to the Lord, whatever that turns out to mean. Notice, she's the other unsung hero here, or heroine, I guess you'd say, because she is totally obedient See, subjection to your father, the crushing burden will be hers, and not only hers, by the way, we'll get it, but uh, she's, she's dutiful. She said unto him, My father, if thou hast opened thy mouth unto the Lord, do to me according to what thou hast proceeded out of thy mouth. For as much as the Lord hath taken vengeance for thee of thine enemies, even the children of Ammon. She said unto her father, Let this thing be done for me. Let me alone two months that I may go up and down upon the mountains and bewail my coming death. Is that what it says? No, bewail my virginity and my fellows. So she wants her girlfriends to spend some time in the hills with her to bewail a tragic, tragic outcome for her to not to be able to marry and bear children, especially in that culture, was a heavy deal. It's a heavy deal for him too because it means he will have no issue. So he loves her, and that would cause him to be grieved for her, but also in his own selfish way. He will have no heirs. He'll have no offspring. Because it was only child, and she is going to be committed to the Lord, to service at the tabernacle, and not be uh, bearing. And he said, he, she asked, just give me a couple months with my girlfriends. He says, go. And he sent her away for two months, and she went with her companions and bewailed her virginity for, upon the mountains. What seems to be in the text pretty clearly is that what she's upset about is her virginity. She's not bewailing the fact that she's going to live for two months. I mean, if she was due to be executed in two months, I suspect her virginity would not be the biggest concern. <laughs> it came to pass at the end of two months that she returned unto her father, who did with her according to his vow which he had vowed. And she knew no man and it was a custom in Israel, an ordinance, if you will, that uh, the daughters of Israel went yearly to lament the daughter of Jephthah the Gileadite four days a year. I suspect, most commentators seem to presume, that this was not national. The, the reign of Jephthah was really in that Gilead region. But in that region, once a year, the gals found a way to, it says lament. The term is actually um, tana. It's to recount Rehearse, tell again. It's to celebrate. It's to attribute honor is what the term really means. And uh, so it, it, her, it, they're celebrating her devotion and her obedience. And uh, it's not lament like they're grieving in the, in the, in the sense like, uh, like for a funeral. So she actually deserves uh, to stand with Isaac uh, as a faithful child, willing to obey both father and God no matter what the cost. We have to celebrate the daughter of Jephthah. So there's some lessons here that we can focus on as we sort of close chapter 11. And that is that God 
expects us to keep our commitments. I won't ask for a show of hands, because I'd have to confess to you there's probably more ways than I can number where I fail to do that. As I go back in my life, I can I, I shudder to even begin to enumerate the ways that I have grieved my Heavenly Father. So I, I stand before you as one who is not pointing fingers at anyone, but I do believe that the text teaches us that God expects us to be faithful to our commitments. And I think the step, the first step, and, I, I, and you know, I've noticed this among the really top financiers that I've dealt with over a 30-year corporate development career. The really sharp guys are very cautious and slow to impl even imply a commitment. Something I learned from them, two things. They're very cautious about even implying a commitment until they're really ready. Once given, even though it's just verbal, you could bank on it. You could bank on it. Now, these guys, for all I know, may have been immoral. They may have been cheating on their wives, for all I know. I'm not getting into that area. But in the business world, if they said it, you could, you could write checks on it. Because that was the uh, ethic they lived by. My word is my bond. And I still believe, despite uh, the notorious examples in their press lately, I still believe the top door people in corporate America are the, a cut of the same cloth for some very simple reasons. Marketing costs are too high, and that community is a closed club. And you're, you're going to be sitting across that same table a year from now negotiating a similar deal with the same people. That's just the realities of it. It's not a question of somehow holier than thou thing. It's a question of that's the kind of reputation you have to have to play that game. The tragedy in our culture is that we've disconnected character from destiny. There are fast buck guys that have made millions and that, that shreds the need for character as a prerequisite uh, qualification for that club. But anyway, no, the absence of the sanctity of commitment in our society, we don't have to focus just on vows before God. I think most of us were, are, are probably, uh, even in our worst case, fearful enough of, of God that we don't, aren't stupid enough to make some kind of hard commitment to him that we don't keep. That's really dumb. I remember years ago, there used to be a series of ads that, you know, you don't presume on Mother Nature. They had a series of ads. You know, I've often, those ads always, used to amuse me because people, they, they're making jokes out of it, sort of. But even if you're not a believer, there ought to be, at the pit of your stomach, enough fear that you don't mess around making commitments with God you don't keep. But okay, let's move on. Uh, that's chapter 11. We got uh, chapter 12 forthcoming. Now, we have this big victory. Jephthah did whatever he did. I personally believe that we've, what we've got involved there is that his daughter is committed then to a life of uh, a virgin servant to the uh, religious establishment. But now the men of Ephraim, these guys are troublemakers. They were, remember back in Gideon, uh, we had problems with those guys. Back in chapter 8, Gideon had... Um, had this incredible victory, and the Ephraimites, once the victory was in, they felt that they should participate. Gideon dealt with it with diplomacy. He flattered them, so he eased the tension. But we need to understand there is a root tension between the Ephraimites on the West Bank in that area and the Gileadites, which are not limited to, but primarily on the East Bank. You may recall that when they're coming into the land uh, in the days of Joshua and so forth that Reuben, Gad, and about half the tribe of Manasseh liked the looks of the Golan Heights area. Very fertile, great place for cattle. They said, we're going to stay here. You guys can go ahead and cross the Jordan and go fight your battles with those mean guys, those giants in the Canaan and so forth. And Joshua said, no, wait a minute. We need you as part of the team. Your men of war come with us, fight the battle. And when we've won, you can come back and claim this land. He says, that's a deal. And they did, pretty much. They went with Joshua and went through that whole seven-year campaign. When it was over, they went and they took the land, but they took the land east of the Jordan, an area that includes a little more than what we call the Golan Heights today. But there were tensions. The, the Jordan River boundary seemed to create problems. The people who crossed over looked back at them as being wimps. So the, there's an attitude problem between the Ephraimites and the Gileadites. And that continues. That's why the Ephraimites are trying to cut themselves in on Gideon's deal. He flatters them out of that. But this time, they're up against a different guy. Jephthah is a man of the hills. He's a guy that made his living as a brigand. He's a guy that was the general of this army that clobbered the Ammonites, which had bothered them for 18 years. That's a long time. 
but with Jephthah, he's, he, he come back to victory. Now, at this stage in Judges 12, verse 1, the men of Ephraim, the leaders of Ephraim, gathered themselves together and went northward and said unto Jephthah, Wherefore passest thou over to fight against the children of Ammon, and didst not call us to go with thee? Baloney, but anyway. We will burn thine house with thee, upon thee with fire. They're not having an argument. They're going to burn his house down. This is, they, they are nasty, vicious things going on here. Okay? And uh, they, they, should, they felt they should share the glory of victory, even though they weren't willing to risk their necks in the battle. So they only had hostility, of course, for Jephthah and so forth. And this is a longstanding tension. So, but Jephthah doesn't do what Gideon does. Gideon tried flattery and diplomacy and sort of quieted down. Jephthah says, in effect, up yours, guys. Here we go. Jephthah said unto them, I and my people were at great strife with the children of Ammon. And when I called you, ye delivered me not out of their hands. In other words, you weren't there, guys. And when I saw that ye delivered me not, I put my life in my hands and passed over against the children of Ammon, and the Lord delivered them into mine hand. Notice he didn't take credit for it. He gives God the credit. This is a good guy here. Wherefore then are ye come up unto me this day to fight against me? Missler's translation, you've got to be kidding. <laughs> it's interesting, he uses four arguments if you unravel that. His first concern was not them, was to defeat the Ammonites, not to please his neighbors. This is my kind of guy. He has focus. For 18 years, Ephraim had not offered to come up against the Ammonites. They're sitting on the sidelines. Furthermore, they hadn't responded to his call for tribes to assist. And they claim to have, but he denies it. That's nonsense. But the final point he makes is the Lord didn't seem to need them. The Lord managed real nice without the Ephraimites. So what does he do? What does Jephthah do? This guy doesn't mess around. Jephthah gathered together all the men of Gilead and fought with Ephraim. And before the smoke clears, by the way, he's going to wipe out 42,000 of them. That's a bunch. Especially in those days. And Jephthah gathered together all the men of Gilead and fought with Ephraim. And the men of Gilead smote Ephraim because they said, Ye Gileads are fugitives from Ephraim among the Ephraimites and among the, the uh, Manassites. And uh, the Gileads took the passages of Jordan before the Ephraimites. And it was so that when those Ephraimites which were escaped. Now the word escaped is actually a renegade or a fugitive. It's a escape to sort of a plight term. It's a, it could, if we were translating, probably consider them fugitive or escapes. It said, let me go over. In other words, they're at the Jordan. The Gileads control the passage across the Jordan uh, before the Ephraimites. And it was so that when those Ephraimites which were es escaped or fugitives said, let me go over, <laughs> that the men of Gilead said unto him, art thou an Ephraimite? And if he said no or nay, then they said unto him, say now, Shibboleth. And he said, Sibboleth, for he could not frame to pronounce it right. Then they took him and slew him at the passages of Jordan, and there fell at the time of the Ephraimites 42,000. Now this word Shibboleth is an interesting word. In the Hebrew it means, it can mean either a stream, or it also can mean an ear of grain or ear of corn. Now the Ephraimites had an inability to um, pronounce an aspirant. The sh is something that was not in their, in their vocabulary. By the way, the Greeks have the same problem. There's an S, but no SH sound in their articulation. So if you ask them, are you an Ephraimite? They say, no, not us. They'd say, pronounce shibboleth. And they couldn't do it. They would say sibboleth, which was a giveaway. It's a giveaway. So then they, you know, for him, it was a dead giveaway. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Here's the word shibboleth, which means stream or ear of corn. And here's the word sibboleth, which is, it has a different meaning in the Hebrew. It's, it's actually spelled differently. The first letter is a different letter. first letter of shibboleth is a shin. And the first letter of the sibboleth is a stomach. So it's S sound. It means burden. It's a slightly different word. But the main point is they couldn't pronounce it, you see. And there are examples of that in many dialects in our present culture. There are certain groups of people can't pronounce certain words. You know, I'm always reminded of the guy that was uh, in, in Hawaii. And he walked up to a guy on the street and says, you know, I've wondered for years 
is it Hawaii or Hawaii? The guy says, it's Hawaii. He says, thank you. He says, you're welcome. (laughs) Anyway, the word shibboleth then becomes an idiom in our language. It usually implies a hint of some special insider relationship. It's used in the cryptographic community as a code word. In fact, there's a a popular, not real popular, but there's a a new movie out called Wind Talkers. Because during World War II, they used Indians to act as phone talkers because the Japanese couldn't translate it. They didn't have any guidebooks for Navajo or whatever it was. You see? And so they used code talkers. They made a movie out of that called The Wind Talkers. It's been featured lately. But by the way, the same dialectical issue shows up in the New Testament. Do you remember Peter when he's warming his fire the very late night Gethsemane? After a while, he came to him that stood by and said to Peter, Surely thou art also one of them. For thy speech betrayeth thee. See, Peter was a Galilean. He's down in Judah. He's down in Jerusalem. He's, he's tangled up in this uh, trial. But they're, they're putting the Lord through six trials that night. Three Jewish trials and three Roman trials. But he's on the sidelines, but trying to be unidentified. But they spot him as a Galilean. Why? Because thy speech betrayeth thee. He apparently, I don't know if it's the same dialectical problem, but clearly his ability to pronounce words is distinctive enough to nail him as a Galilean. In fact, Mark elaborates on this. In Mark 14, it says, A maid saw him again and began to say unto them, and stood by, This is one of them. And he denied it again. And a little after, they have stood by and said again to Peter, Surely thou art one of them. Thou art a Galilean, for thy speech agreeth thereto. You see the, the hint there. And uh, so I think that's interesting. Now, Jesus did warn us that our words, for, thy, for by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. And so there, this, this idea of a shibboleth is like a code word. There is a word, I'll call it a code word, that will focus our lives and will guarantee our entrance into heaven. Do you know that? That word is kuriat. That's the word for Lord. Jesus is Lord. And we who acknowledge Jesus as Lord, Kuriat becomes our shibboleth, if you will, that will bring us into the promise and fullness of God. Just a thought as we pass, but let's move on. Jephthah judged Israel six years. Then he died, Jephthah the Gilead, and was buried in one of the cities of Gilead. And now we move on. We have three final guys in this chapter about which we know relatively little. After him, Ibzan of Bethlehem judged Israel. Now this is not necessarily the Bethlehem that we all know down south in Judah, Bethlehem Ephrathah, that the prophet Micah talks about and that, of course, Jesus was born in. Uh, But it's interesting that Josephus tells us that Ibzan was of the tribe of Judah, So there are some expositors that presume it could be Bethlehem down there, but the evidence is against it. There was also a Bethlehem up in Zebulun, up in this area. It is only about six miles from Nazareth. So there's two Bethlehems. That's why Micah says, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though thou be little among the thousand Jews. It's identifying which Bethlehem we're talking about. But there is a Bethlehem that was up north, and Ibzan probably was, even though he's from Judah, he was living up there, we believe. There's not much said about him, except he had 30 sons, that's a bunch, and 30 daughters, that's really a bunch, whom he sent abroad and took in 30 daughters from abroad for his son. So he's got 60 gals. Man. And uh, he judged Israel seven years and then died Ibzan and was buried in Bethlehem. And so uh, Josephus uh, makes the point that other than being the head of a very large family, he did nothing in the seven years of administration that was worthy of recording. I I think he's being a little hard on him. The fact that it was peace for seven years is a compliment. Let's not be too hard on this guy. Now, every Jew is supposed to teach his sons three things. The law, Torah, a trade, and to find a wife. And he's got 30 of these to take care of. Plus, yeah, okay. <laughs> so he had his hands full. So I'd be, I wouldn't be too hard on him. We don't know anything else about him. Let's move on to the next couple of verses. Verse 11, 12. After him, Elon, the Zebulonites, again, they're up in that region, judged Israel. And he judged Israel 10 years. And Elon the Zebulonite died and was buried in Ajalon in the country of Zebulun. So we know even a little less about him. 
But it is kind of interesting that Elon and Ijalon in the Hebrew are identical if it's not pointed. Now remember the ancient Hebrew did not have pointing, that is not have vowels. Uh, contemporary Hebrew has what they call points, little dots and codes typically below the letters that tell you how to sound the word because it's, it's devoid of vowels. So these are two different words, but they look the same when written. You infer the sounds in the old days. So it's very possible that the village is probably named after Elan. It's probably his name as a village. It's interesting that Ajalon is not listed in the Zeb Zebulonite cities that are listed in Joshua 19, verses 10 through 16. So that sort of implies that this has been named after Elon, the possessor of it. And we have one more, and that's a guy, after him came Abdon, the son of Hillel, a Parathonite that judged Israel. Now this guy, whew, he had 40 sons and 30, the word is nephews in your tra King James translation, it actually is sons, sons. They're really what you and I would call grandchildren. And that's quite a bunch. So he had 40 sons and 30 grandchildren. There's 70 of these guys. Now, you know why grandparents and grandchildren get along so well? You always notice that? They always get along really well. They're united by a common enemy. Okay. He had 40 sons and 30 nephews that, that rode on three score and ten. In other words, 70 ass coats. Now, there, I did encounter one of the expositors that suggests the, the, the likelihood that the term for ass coats which is a strange term. It's neither an ass nor a colt. It's sort of a combination. So many people presume they're mules. It may be a synonym for horses. That could make all the sense of the world because these are, they seem to be presented here as an emblem of wealth. In any case, whatever they are. And he judged Israel eight years and Abdon the son of Hillel, the Pirathonite, died and was buried in Parathon in the land of Ephraim in the Mount of the Amalekites. So there we have it. Now, it's interesting after the victories of Jephthah and then the leadership of his three successors, Israel enjoyed 31 years of peace and security. I think that's interesting. Now, it's interesting perhaps for, first of all, just as a pragmatic reason, they had 30, that's a long time, they had 31 years of peace. They're not used to it. They had 18 years of oppression prior and, and more, but, uh, and, and 31 years of peace. But there's that number, the 31 to any Orthodox Jew is the number of God. Number of God. That's the, if you take the letters of L, the word for God, it adds up to 31. So 31 is recognized among the Orthodox as an uh, emblem of some kind of God. So I think it's because it was God's victory that delivered them from the 31 years of peace. But it's, a, it's a, such a paradox because the hero of the big battle, the defeat of the Ammonites, and subsequently the trouncing of Ephraim, these are two major victories. The, God, the hero of both of those engagements had no family. Because his daughter, in that situation, he had no issue. Yet his successors have all these children and grandchildren. It's interesting. Now, we have reviewed the threat of the Ammonites from the east. But there's another group that's going to surface on our horizon in the next cha for a few chapters. And that's from the west. In fact, you might say the southwest. We're, the Ammonites in the east have been re resolved, but now we're going to discover a long duration of harassment by the Philistines. The Philistines are not Shemites, they're Hamites. And they're ethnically a totally different group of people. Uh, they had a corner on iron chariots. And in that world, that was a technological advantage that was incredible, that erodes by the time you get to Saul and David and so forth. But they have... A, very, very, very powerful. So we've dealt with, in the last few chapters, the threat from the, the east, from the Ammonites. In the next chapter, we're going to explore the Philistines. And the key player here, especially in this first episode, is the fabled and paradoxical, if you will, career of Samson. And uh, he's the one that harassed the Philistines. So your assignment for the next session will be chapters 13 through 16. We won't try to necessarily take it all in one session, but that's the chunk of, of Samson. I remember there was a many, many years ago, some of you are too young to remember it, and some of you are too old to remember it. <laughs> uh, it was a book, uh, Cecil B. DeMille did a movie about Samson, Samson and Delilah. 
And I'll never, what impressed me about that movie, even as a kid, I forget the year it was, but I think I was a teenager or, or I, was, I was young at the time. I remember in the titling of it, it was based on Josephus and this and that, and then he came up with great flair, Judges 13 to through 16. And I went through my whole life remembering Samson. Yeah, that's Judges 13 through 16 because I remember the titling on that movie. But anyway, that's your thing. I want you to contrast as you skim those chapters, 13 through 16. Notice his successes. Let's not detract from the guy. He did some interesting things. But he also had some serious failures. This is a hero that's flawed. He's the light that flickered, as some commentators say. And what did his hair have to do with anything? And that's your assignment. So we'll again get at it uh, in our next session. Those of you that are in discussion groups, you might want to, in your, as a little assignment, you can take, make tape of paper, see if you can list the references that highlight Jephthah's spiritual condition and his walk with the Lord in, those, in the chapters 11 and 12. You might also, if you want to analyze your own view about what, what really happened about his vow, uh, if you're in a discussion group, I encourage you to discuss the role of vows in our society today. And uh, what does that have to do with marriage vows? I'll let you kick that around. Uh, in the discussion group, that's, that's where if two people agree, one is unnecessary, okay? And so, but I do encourage you to get prepared for next session because it, uh, uh, Samson is going to be a colorful, colorful time. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer. Well, Father, we do thank you that you are a God of grace and forgiveness. And we thank you, Father, that you've gone to such extremes to pay for all of our failings and shortcomings. We thank you, Father, that you have given your son to pay for the innumerable ways that we grieve you, that all of our failings, not only the big ones, but the little ones, all of them were nailed to that cross. Not only the, the things we've done, Father, but the things that we, the places that we'll stumble tomorrow and next week, you have chosen to lay on him. That we might have standing, his standing, before your throne. Oh, Father, the more we try to apprehend that, the more undone we are to realize how much you must love us. We thank you, Father, for Jephthah and the lessons from his life. We also, Father, are grieved as we consider the commitments, although given in sincerity, were nevertheless failures on our part. So, Father, we do ask your forgiveness and your cleansing, pleading the blood of Jesus Christ. We pray, Father, you teach us to be cautious in making commitments and discerning. And yet, Father, we also look to you to empower, enable those commitments that are born of the Spirit, Father that we each might not only grow in grace and the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, but also, Father, that we might be more fruitful and diligent stewards of the opportunities and the resources that you've put before us. We thank you for your word, Father, and we thank you for your spirit to illuminate the word to our lives. As we do indeed commit ourselves without any reservation into your hands. In the name of Yeshua, our Joshua, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.